Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to be discussing with you one of the great classic topics of biology, and that's how eukaryotic cells, that would be cells that possess a nucleus like our cells, how they regulate gene expression. That's right. And so it's really interesting on how cells regulate gene expression because when you think about it, at the very heart and soul of this, if you think about it, it's how cells really differentiate between each other and how they specialize. And so this is really crucial importance in terms of uh, developmental biology and also uh, the future of biology in terms of how stem cells are thought to become specialized. Like for example, let me just get into this conversation. Gene expression, uh, in other words, how transcription uh, is going to be regulated and translation is gonna be regulated, uh, occurs in many profound ways. And this particular video is a look at chromatin modification in particular. And so this conversation has to revolve around a simple question. In other words, like from one cell to zygote, how is it that we were able to develop into stratified muscle cells? And how do we develop it into red blood cells and white blood cells and uh, chondrocytes and osteoblast and fibroblast, all those different cell types? How does that happen? Because for that specialization to take place, multicellular organism, organisms need to regulate their gene expression in order to specialize. And so this particular, as I said before, video is on chromatin modification. And so if you didn't realize this, let me be the first one to tell you that almost all cells in an organism are genetically identical. So if they're identical, in other words, my cheek cell and my muscle cells and my uh, nervous uh, cells, neurons, they all have the same DNA. So any differences between them is how genes are expressed. In other words, the expression of the different genes uh, within the same genome will cause differentiation to occur. And so that's pretty cool. So it's really important to understand why a gene would be expressed and why a gene would not be expressed. And so to get into this conversation, let me review a little bit in terms of DNA in the nucleus. You might be familiar with this, but DNA, in order to condense itself, in order to fit into the nucleus, here's a, a, uh, a picture of DNA. It wraps itself or coils itself around proteins in the nucleus called histones. Let's see if I can rotate that. And so What's interesting is you get these histone proteins that sort of look three-dimensional like hockey pucks a little bit, and you have DNA coiling twice around them. And if I were to, to back that up a little bit and take a look at this picture, you could see here that the DNA shown in blue is wrapping around twice over these histone proteins. And this is inside the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. Now, this causes the DNA to shorten, obviously, because it's being wrapped around, but then it needs to supercoil further and further. And so these beads on a string, if you will, are famously known as a nucleosome. And then nucleosomes further, in, in terms of their hierarchy, super condense and form what are the uh, basis of a chromosome. In other words, sister chromatids attached by a centromere. And so that's what I wanted to show you, just a, sort of a visual of that. Um, let's go back over here. So the DNA in a eukaryotic cell is packaged by these histone proteins. And these proteins have these little tails coming off of here. Here's a picture of a transmission electron micrograph of just DNA, uh, uh, naked DNA. And then here it is uh, wrapping around histone proteins, uh, forming what's known as the, the nucleosome. The term uh, chromatin, which is what this video is about, chromatin modification, and how that relates to gene expression. Chromatin's an older term, but it's still useful. It, it refers to the colored material inside the nucleus. And so, you know, just a, a few uh, factual points here that I find kind of uh, interesting, that the human genome in particular has three billion base pairs. That's quite a lot. 
And if you think about it, the nucleus is typical nucleus in a cell is about five microns in diameter. And so if you really do some calculations on this, you, you can find out that the DNA itself is, if you were to string it out, is three meters in length. Now, that's going to not fit into five microns in a nucleus unless it's it's coiled up. And so that's one of the reasons why the DNA is coiled up around nucleosomes. But the other reason is so that it can be, genes can be regulated. In other words, transcribed or not transcribed. It's going to be much easier to transcribe a gene if uh, the, D, if the uh, RNA polymerase is able to actually attach to the promoter. And so chromatin modification is what we're talking about right here. And so the basic unit is the nucleosome. There's a couple of different kinds of nucleosomes. We're not going to get into that level of detail, but they exist. There's eight that make up each little uh, bead and so there's uh, tetra, two tetrameres, if you will. This is the diameter of, of, uh, of one of them. And then they all have different names. Uh, the H1 refers to us as a histone that sort of separates the beads with one another. And the nucleosome uh, is about 10 nanometer fiber, if you will, just to give you some size perspective. And so um, this packaging, as I said, uh, helps the DNA to fit inside of the nucleus, but it's not just that. It helps to regulate gene expression. And so what this conversation is now going to turn into is how the cell chemically modifies histones and DNA to influence their structure and therefore their gene expression. So we're going to talk about how the histones are kind of uh, tampered with and how DNA is tampered with in order to influence uh, gene expression. And so the two processes that I want to discuss in this cr uh, chromatin modification is acetylation and methylization. Acetylation is going to be when we add acetyl groups to the histone proteins, and methylization is when we add methyl functional groups, CH3, to the DNA itself. And so let's talk first about histone modification, in other words, known as histone acetylation. So Acetyl groups, you might be familiar with acetyl. Uh, it's a fairly famous molecule. Uh, I'll refer you back to the Krebs cycle when we, when we discussed or you've read about acetyl-CoA as being one of the first substrates in the Krebs cycle. So it's a small uh, carbon structure. With, so the acetyl group gets attached to the histones. If you notice in this picture here, are the histones with those little tails coming out right here, the acetyl groups attach to positively charged amino acid lysine. There's a lot of lysine in, in the histone protein, especially on the surface and on these tails. The reason being that if you think about it, DNA is a poly anion molecule. In other words, it's very negative because of the phosphate functional groups. And so DNA is happy to coil around positively charged histone proteins. And so when an enzyme comes along called histone acetyltransferase, acetyl groups attach to those lysines and make them more neutral. And therefore, you might predict, the DNA loosens around those histones. And therefore, uh, promoting the initiation of transcription. In other words, the, it allows for enzymes like RNA polymerase to therefore attach to the promoter region of the DNA and then the gene is transcribed and therefore the cell is able to ultimately, jumping forward, produce a protein and therefore specialize in some particular way. And so histones are modified by acetylation to the, to the uh, tails, as you can see here. So they're chemically modified. They're, therefore, when the histone becomes less positive, the DNA goes from uh, highly coiled to a little bit more loose, like this, and therefore it promotes gene expression. Okay, let me uh, uh, take a little uh, detour from this and show you uh, what I found uh, as being a particularly interesting video here discussing this. H -dax. Within the chromosome, DNA is packaged into chromatin. 
chromatin consists of DNA, structural histone proteins, and non-histone proteins. So you can see Within the nucleosome chromatin, there. the repeating unit is the nucleosome. Nucleosome. So you can see the the uh, the histones located here and the tails coming out, and the DNA coils around twice. So around 146, 147 base pairs total surround that bead. These are made up of 146 base pairs of two superhelical turns of DNA wrapped around a core of eight histones. The histones are responsible for maintaining the chromatin's shape and structure. Epigenetic modifications, such as histone acetylation, occur at the amino terminal tails of the histones that protrude from the nucleosomes. So there's the uh, the histone uh, acetyl transferase shown here in yellow, and it's adding acetyl groups to the lysines, therefore uh, making the histone less positive. Acetylation of histones is generally acknowledged to play a key role in the regulation of gene expression. Histone acetylation is controlled by the balance in the activity of two enzymes, histone acetyltransferase, or HAT, and histone deacetylase, or HDAC. For a gene to be transcribed, it must become physically accessible to transcriptional machinery. Acetylation of histones by HAT causes uncoiling of DNA and an open chromatin structure. So pretty cool. It allows for uh, the loosening and tightening up of the, of the DNA. Okay, I hope that was, that was interesting. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about chromatin modification as, it's in, as it affects uh, gene regulation in chromatin. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how the DNA itself is influenced chemically. And so in addition to the histone modification, methyl groups, in other words, uh, CH3, shown over here, CH3, uh, let me go back to that, CH3 is attached to cytosine, one of the nitrogenous bases that happens to be uh, a pyrimidine. So methyl groups are attached directly to the DNA. And so what that does is that the, the methyl group is thought to reduce transcription. And so Therefore, it regulates gene expression. When methyl groups are attached, it reduces uh, transcription to occur. And so DNA methylization is the adding, as I said before, methyl groups shown here in gigantic red, <laughs> uh, I guess. <laughs> okay, so this is CH3 right here, CH3 right here. And so methyl groups are being attached. And so the, this is separate from acetylation. This is methylization. DNA methylization. And so it reduces transcription uh, in the cell. And so what's kind of interesting, fascinating, if you will, is the DNA methylization can cause long term, if there's a lot of methyl groups on there, inactivation of the genes. And again, that's not bad. It's, it causes the genes to be turned off in, uh, in the genome. And so therefore, only other genes are on, and so therefore the cells are able to specialize. Like in other words, you don't want the gene, for example, uh, in your uh, to produce the the enzyme protein digesting enzyme pepsinogen to be functional in your brain. You don't want that to occur, and so you want methylization to take place, and therefore cells are able to differentiate by that. And then this brings up an, a very fascinating. Uh, discovery that, that biologists have made fairly recently, within the last decade or so. Uh, so what's fascinating is that we refer to the, the chromatin modification that I was just discussing to DNA and histones as it, it's inheritable. So those, those changes, in other words, adding those methyl groups to the DNA are passed on to future generations. And, but it doesn't influence the DNA sequence. Normally we think that what is actually being passed on from generation to generation is never experiences. We're like, well, the experiences in your life are not inheritable. This is what we used to believe for a long time. We used to think that only DNA sequence is what's passed on from one generation to the next. But now we know that these chemical mod modifications to DNA are inheritable 
and it's what's opening up a whole new field of molecular genetics known as epigenetic inheritance. So epi meaning upon. So this is standing upon the sequence. So we're not altering, this is not a mutation, we're not altering nucleotide sequence, but we are influencing the potential uh, protein uh, production and cell differentiation in future generations when modification takes place in this way. So in other words, you ready for this? Experiences in a person's life might be in instances uh, transmitted to the next generation. It's pretty profound. And so let me give you an example of this, in, just in case you're, you're skeptical of it. When you look at identical twin studies, now identical twins, as you may know, have the exact same DNA sequence. It's been shown that experiences, now obviously they're different individuals and, you, and they can't have the same um, experience. They, they eat different, they have different environmental chemical uh, influence, and those things might be causing different uh, chemical modifications of their chromatin. And so when you actually look at the DNA, it shows different DNA methylization occurring. So early on in the twin's life, the DNA methylization is the same, but then when you uh, test that later as an adult, there's different methylization occurring in those two individuals. And the consequences of this are, are quite profound. It's even making the cover of, of uh, popular periodicals uh, such as Time Magazine asking questions why your DNA isn't your destiny. And so there's ways in which your upbringing or your, the, the, the positive or negative influences in your life can affect uh, the next generation. It's fascinating. And so more to come in this area. And so another uh, example of this, gestational diabetes, you, you may be familiar with this, is that ma mammals can experience hormone triggered type of diabetes during pregnancy. And it's known as gestational diabetes. What I mean by that is if a mother's uh, blood sugar level is particularly high, a little bit ab abnormally high for a variety of reasons, uh, it therefore makes uh, glucose more available to the growing, developing fetus. And so the fetus, in return, responds to that environmental influence by producing uh, her own high levels of insulin in order to handle that extra glucose. And so the extra glucose then gets stored as it does normally in the form of adipose tissue. And so the baby is a little bit larger than normal. And so you know, so what? Well, when the mother uh, has gestational diabetes, it, that environment uh, affects the developing fetus. And so the high glucose triggers epigenic, epigenetic changes in the daughter's DNA, which increases the likelihood that she will develop gestational diabetes when she becomes pregnant someday. So that's just a quick example of the um, the possible effects of epigenetics. And so I hope you enjoyed this particular video on the regulation of gene expression in eukaryotes and in particular of chromatin modification. Thanks for watching.